Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. This is Left Think Books welcomes award-winning author Scott Alexander Hess, who will discuss his new pair of novellas, The Root of Everything and Lightning. Tonight, Hess will be in conversation with St. Louis author Donald Miller. Left Bank Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We would like to thank all of our supporters, the supporters of Scott and Donald, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. We offer curbside pickup and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world even. We have our doors open. Well, not currently. We are closed for the evening, but you can come back inside and browse our shelves. We are so incredibly happy that people can come back in the store now. And we are happy to be able to bring our event series virtual. We believe that events are a way to expand your mind and bring in new thoughts to make the world a better place. We hope that you enjoy this event, and we hope that you support Left Bank Books by purchasing a signed copy for you or for your friends at left-bank.com. Purchasing a signed copy of the book from Left Bank Books allows us to keep our bookstore and staff operating, and it allows us to keep this event series going. So thank you for your support. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis. We will be taking questions from you, the audience, at the end of the event. So you can type your questions as a comment at any point in time throughout the uh, event. And uh, type in comments, too. Tell us where you're coming from. Tell us uh, how excited you are to be here. Whatever you want to say. Uh, and be sure to follow Left Bank Books on Facebook and YouTube to be notified about all of our fantastic virtual events. A special note, for this event, you may request personalization for your order. Leave a note in the comments when you're checking out for how you would like the book to be signed. As an example, you can write to Scott, happy birthday. And Scott will come in and sign and personalize copies. The deadline for personalization request is July 25th. As another note, in case you needed more enticement to order this book from Left Bank Books, uh, Scott is offering t-shirts uh, for this event. If you order your book before July 25th, you can request a small, medium, or large t-shirt. And if your book is being mailed to you, you must select priority mail or FedEx for shipping. Unfortunately, t-shirts don't apply for media, <laughs> so a uh, little rule that the government has. Um so you can just type in, I want my book signed to me, and I would like a medium t-shirt, whatever the case may be. And we will make sure that that happens when Scott comes in to sign after the 25th. And now about tonight's book, The Root of Everything and Lightning. In this pair of novellas, award-winning author Scott Alexander Hess provides a richly textured portrait of the shifting landscape of the 20th century American dream. The Root of Everything is a multi-generational saga tracking fathers and sons from Germany's Black Forest to Missouri as they experience tragedy, triumph, forbidden love, and hard-earned reckonings. In Lightning, a young man in Fayetteville, Arkansas in 1918 is driven by his deep love for horses and his emerging feelings for another man. Offered a chance to move to New York City, he finds his true destiny. Shot through with layers of grief, passion, dangerous landscapes, and old-world mysticism, these are journeys into love, loss, and twists of fate that define us. Hess tells stories as deep as the Missouri River and as wide-ranging as the wild American West. Joe Okinakwo, Okin Okonakwo, I feel like I'm still getting that Okonkwo, there we go. I feel like that is maybe more accurate. The author of Kiss the Scars on the Back of My Neck and Jazz Moon says, Scott Alexander Hess's writing brims with elegant, elegant simplicity and pulses with fierce emotional insight. And Patrick E. Horrigan, the author of Pennsylvania Station says, in the root of everything enlightening, Scott Alexander Hess uncovers deep affinities with between the wide openness of the American landscape and the wide-eyed optimism of its people, cowmen and farmers, fortune tellers and hard laborers, queer fellows and new women. Sinuously constructed and simmering with eroticism, these short, short novels nevertheless pack emotional punch, historical fiction at its cutting edge best. And now about tonight's speakers. Scott Alexander Hess is the author of five novels, including Skyscraper, 
a Lambda Literary Award finalist, and The Butcher's Sons, which was named a Kirkus Review's Best Book of 2015. His writing has appeared in HuffPost, Genre Magazine, The Fix, uh, Thema Literary Review, and elsewhere. Hess co-wrote Tom in America, an award-winning short film starring Sally Kirkland and Burt Young. He teaches fiction writing at Gotham Writers Workshop and curates Hot Lit, an LGBTQ plus themed monthly newsletter. Originally from St. Louis, Missouri, Hess lives in New York City with his husband. And tonight, Scott will be in conversation with Donald C. Miller. Donald holds a master's degree in media literacy and has co-authored a previous media literacy textbook with Art Silverblatt. And now, without further ado, if you would please help me in welcoming our fantastic guest for the evening, we have Scott Alexander Hess and Donald C. Miller. Hello. Hello. Hey, thank you. We have a great audience watching already, and I'm certain more will join us. Uh, so I'm going to leave this to you to uh, have an incredible conversation. We can't wait to come back for the audience Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Shane. And thanks to Left Banks for having me. I love being here. Thanks, Don. And um, it's great to be on screen. I was at Left Banks two years ago for The River Runs Red uh, and saw a lot of St. Louis people. So hopefully you're out there in the virtual world while I'm here in my New York city apartment with my hubby. Um, so before we jump into it with Don, I'm going to read a tiny bit um, from The Root of Everything. Um, just a little bit. Um, the second book is Lightning, but I'm going to um, give you a tiny bit from uh, Root of Everything, which is about three generations of fathers and sons. And this is at the beginning when one of the men, uh, Richard, with his brother Rolf, they've come from Germany. And here we go. Richard, America, 1905. They rode the rails for a long spell, Richard and his younger brother Rolf, looking out with wild fascination through a railroad car door that slid open with a thunderous roar, revealing what they had only dreamed of, America. They traveled in steerage by sea from Essen, Germany, then snuck onto a North Pacific railroad car in New York, joining a few hobos who drank much and spoke little, which suited Richard and Rolf as they knew only a few words of English. It was a frigid November, so the railroad car door remained shut, and the main sh men shook with cold, though a few times Richard cracked it open to get some air, taking in a clear-eyed view of long, flat lands piercing a burnt blue horizon, and after dusk shimmering things under a full moon, distant towns and night creatures, at times a million stars. At other times, if the train crawled to a stop due to some disruption blocking the track, the night appeared dangerous and lonesome to Richard. This new land, men speaking in a language he did not understand, strange cities and customs, left him momentarily wondering if they had made a grave error leaving their homeland. He pushed his fears aside, though, holding strong to a bright and bold hope. During their journey, Rolf spoke constantly of the marvelous thing they would see at the St. Louis World's Fair. Richard told him to hush. They needed to work hard and save money before they could think about the fair. Richard worried about his younger brother. They were heading on the train to a lumber camp in Missouri where there was good work cutting timber if you could stand the cold and hard conditions. They were lean and hungry and young and ready to work. The very air was lit with possibility. And that's from the start. And I'll welcome back Don. Hi, Don. Hey, thanks for that, Scott. Um, so the first issue or item that I wanted to discuss with you a little bit, and I think we got a little bit of a sneak peek at, at some of this, um, the setting or the geography of both novellas are, are really significant to the characters and the themes that you explore. Yes. Um, so if you could, especially for folks who haven't read this yet, obviously, speak a little bit more to how the land in both stories um, affects these characters and vice versa. Right. Yeah, the land. Absolutely. A, a great review just came out in uh, the Master's Review yesterday, which talks a lot about 
the importance and role of the land, which I was grateful for because it was such a part of writing the book. Um, I've always loved setting uh, in the Butcher's Sons. It was a butcher shop in the 30s in New York. River Runs Red, of course, the river is a character. Uh, but this one, um, the land became even more than a character. It, it like really shapes their destinies. Uh, they come from Germany and it, I've got lumber, uh, the earth, like um, their connection to the earth and like what the earth gives them because the trees literally grow up. They rely on that for a living. And then it also causes a tragedy um, that, that nature in the earth um, and then in lightning also uh, they're on a farm. I actually based it on my sister's farm, Kathy, uh, in Fayetteville. Uh, and their need for what the land gives them again is um, it's a little more nurturing there. Like, uh, you know, they have horses, uh, they have crops. Um, but also setting is, is early in my writing. I, I actually read uh, William Gass, who uh, lived in Missouri. Um, he died in Mobile, Missouri, not long ago. He's a very... Um, uh, revered writer. Um, he's written a lot of books. And I read uh, The Peterson Kid, which is so rich in setting. It's set in a blizzard. And I was so impressed with how the weather, the land, the landscape was so integral to the writing and important to the story. I also love Cormac McCarthy. I love language. Um, but this book, it, it, you know, it really became like the heart of the story, um, not just what the characters are doing, but the impact of nature, earth, trees, land. Um, it, you know, it, it all became so intertwined, which is why I called it the root of everything. And also with their emotional life. Like, um, it's weird because I never had the earth, the land, like so it was so emotional in the writing of it um, um, because of the landscapes and the earth. It was it, it, it like, it, it's kind of hard to explain, but it was, it was like part of the heart of the book when usually it's like over here and the characters are really important and they still were, but their connection to earth and land was, was critical. It was like, like I said, it became a character. Yeah, agreed. And just a side note for folks who might be listening who are writers. Um, one thing that I was very impressed uh, by and actually a little envious of because it's not a strength of mine in writing is the descriptive power of the setting itself. Um, some of us are maybe a little bit stronger at uh, dialogue and having an ear for that. And others have really great descriptive power. So just as a side note, I've always struggled when I do any writing of uh, describing a setting. It really doesn't come easily to me. So I was, personally, I was very impressed with the uh, description of the land itself. Right. Yeah. And I, I love, um, I actually love description. I love setting. Mm -hmm. um, I love writers that go in that direction. Yeah. Sometimes where I have to push it back is plot. Um, in my writing group, I'm still the ponies. If you're out there, my writing group, there'll be, I love it, love it. Lyrical, poetic, wonderful writing, setting, great. But let's get back to plot. Like, remember the <laughs> story. Um, right. so the writer have to hone back in. Sure. So. Yeah. All right. Um, so another issue that I found pretty interesting in both stories, but especially the first one, The Root of Everything, mm -hmm. um, both of these novellas focus primarily on male characters. There are some female characters in there, but they focus primarily on male characters. However, um, the female characters also have their own lives and their own journeys. And I wanted you to talk a little bit specifically about the mothers in both stories and and what their journeys are, especially relative to the time frame in which these stories take place. Right, right. Yeah, the when you brought that up as a question, I I realized how important the mothers were. Um, sometimes in my writing, you know, I don't know, I go stream of consciousness. I don't, I, I'm, you know, I discover, but the men are very strong, but. Um, in both of them, uh, the mother in, um, I also had a very good relationship with Strong. My mother was a hoot um, and a writer uh, in her own way. And um, at the root of everything, it's the germ of the story did come from some stories from uh, my mother in particular. And 
I think not based on her journey, but hearing about what it was to be a woman maybe in the 50s, um, I really wanted that mother character to be an absolute individual, um, to really have her own humanity. And while she's a bit on the sidelines, um, she always comes forward with exactly what she wants, with trying to let her husband know um, what she needs and what she wants in life. And she makes some radical choices later in the book, especially for that time period. Uh, mm. And then flip side in lightning, the mother is like an anchor because the father dies, the son very young becomes the, like the man of the house, 1918, Arkansas. Um, I it actually described the mother almost like a tree. He sees her like a tree wavering in the distance. There's a blizzard. I kind of stole that from, from William Gass, but um, and, and she becomes very solid, but that character almost feels an obligation to um, make sure what she's created in her home stays solid for her. So both mothers are strong, but in almost opposite ways in how they react with their family, their sons, and like impact the narrative. Right. Yeah. And if we have time later, I actually do have a passage from Root of Everything regarding the mom and the mm -hmm. son that I wanted to read and just kind of comment on it, because I think I told you through an email, I wasn't expecting it. Right. And it, it took me by surprise in a very um, interesting way. So, right. Right. All right. Yeah. Um, this is something we touched on a little bit, but, you know, it's always a always a hot topic, as they say, given where we're at right now, especially in our uh, politi political climate. Um, how would you say the evolution of equality issues for the LGBTQ community has affected the way that you have written the experience of gay characters, primarily gay men? Um, well, good, bad, I, or indifferent. Yeah, I mean, um, I, as growing up as a gay man, I will always be drawn to um, have. A, a gay character, at least one, in my story, because that's part of my own landscape. Uh, I think my, so that's always been in my writing. It's just, there are some straight people, there's some gay people there, and, and going in different time periods fascinated me because right. uh, when I'm writing 1918 and a young uh, man who is just deciding whether to basically have a relationship with the, a neighbor guy, it's, it, sends me into discovering, well, you know, you thought you might've had a little bit of a struggle, Scott, but good Lord, what would it be like in 1918, Arkansas? I mean, right. not like you come out. So um, I always like exploring those elements, but I did find it a little baffling in the publishing world. Um, and sometimes with even magazines and so forth who would say, oh, this is a racy gay book. And I'm like, well, not really. I mean, it's as straight and gay characters and there are some love making scenes, but it, you know, I mean, my, my, except for my very early work, which is a bit racy, um, my, my uh, sensual scenes are usually very subtle and poetic. So I realized that, oh gosh, people still sometimes put, um, oh, it has a, a, a love making scene and it's gay Woo! put a warning on the front well if it was you know the 50s in the man and the woman i guess it's like oh that's like steinbeck so that's the part that i bristled against at times and would be like where in the world am i you know we, we get stuck in new york in our little world and we think woo, everybody's out loud and proud and you know it's a big world out there so um i do try to, uh, I don't know, keep pushing that this is, um, this is fiction, these are stories, this is humanity, these are people. Um, some of them are gay, some of them are straight, some of them are whatever they are, you know? Um, so, and I, I'll keep on pushing. <laughs> <laughs> so to kind of piggyback on that a little bit in the same vein, uh, you know, family clearly is a common theme in both stories um, regarding family dynamics and relationships and things like that. Um, 
you know, a common theme in a lot of LGBTQ books, especially coming of age books, um, really do explore, especially from a small town perspective, that drive for people to get away from that, to escape that and get into an area that, as you indicated, like the New York bubble, that would be more accepting, more forgiving, et cetera. Um, and this is something we really didn't get into too much via our previous uh, emails. But um, so how did how did your experience growing up gay in St. Louis um, sort of impact your personal journey to move forward with your with your authentic self? Um, you know, I think, um, I know I'm like, oh, I forgot this question. Um, <laughs> I, I think that uh, I always knew my authentic self. Um, I mean, I was a, a, a wacky kid. I used to wear fancy outfits to school and they'd say, don't dress him up. My mother would say, he won't go out of the house if I don't, you know, I've always loved fashion. And so I just always kind of knew I had a destiny and that I would also, I loved the arts. I loved a theater. I loved writing. I wrote my first little teeny novel. Um, I don't know how the heck I was 10 years old or something. It was called the witch's wall. And so I always knew um, that I would, get over here and do my art and be my full self. Uh, I early, I read, and I always say to all my students, it's like, read. But I read all of Jacqueline Susan's work for the older folks out there, Valley of the Dolls, and everybody was always in New York. Oh, there it is. <laughs> once is not enough. I love <laughs> Once is not enough. A terrible movie. But I think Brenda Vaccaro was up for an Oscar. I think you're right. But... I had to hide them because I went to Catholic school and they would throw them away if they found them. But that showed me like, oh, there's this big glamorous world out there and that's where I'm going to be. And right away, I mean, I was very young and I was like, I love St. Louis, I love my family, but that's where I'm headed, you know, um, as soon as, as it's time. Yeah. Um, and then I knew that, I don't know if until I got to New York that I knew like, oh, I'd have the freedom to, you know, um, date men and run around and do all that. But I just kind of knew I'd have freedom. And then when I got here, I was like, oh my God, look at these wild bars. And I mean, in St. Louis, I went to Faces. Did they, <laughs> do they still have Faces? No. Sadly, no. Oh yeah. I mean, and that was East St. Louis. So I was like, woo. I could Living on the edge there and be free and gay too. But yeah, I, I think I always knew I'd get off to New York and I'd bloom, you know. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, and you and I did talk, I think we had a call months and months ago and I, and, we, and I had a good laugh over it because we did talk about, we both had that shared experience as little kids. I've been an avid reader since I can remember. And I literally would steal the book off my mom's bedstand table. And it was typically a Harold Robbins, wow. a Jackie Suzanne, and would look for the dirty parts and dog ear them. And all joking aside, I loved reading. And although, you know, my taste elevated as I got older, uh, clearly I have the Jackie Suzanne here right now for some good trashy summer fun. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's interesting that a lot of writers, I assume a lot, especially gay male writers, may have that similar experience when they were little. I hear that story too often to think it's just sort of um, an outlier. Yeah. And they did have gay characters in their novels. Right. Yeah. Not Maybe not well. the most. Not, not the, the most. Not that well, but. Um, right. But at least right. they were gay, you know. And they at least there was some representation. Yeah, it wasn't great yeah. that they were there. Okay. Um, and then you, I think you alluded to this a few minutes ago when you referred to the other writer who you admire. I think you said you admired his skill, especially with regard to the description of the land and the, you know, events, the, the weather events and things like that. Um, so when you're sitting down to write, a no, well, both novellas, I guess, in this case. Um, clearly, I don't think too many writers just sit down and that just organically comes to them, that level of detail when they're writing that out. So tell us a little bit about when you're when you're writing stories like these, what, what sort of research do you do to make sure that you get it, even though it's fiction, that you get it right, but also more importantly, that it, it feels very sort of visceral to the, to the reader? Yeah, no, I do. I do do my research. Um, I... I use um, memory, like um, of similar, like the certain 
parts of it were set on the Mississippi River or St. Louis or um, so while we use memory, um, but when the beginning is in the Black Forest, so I had to watch um, videos, films, read, and I always look for really authentic language, like what are the actual trees and what do, is the grass like and what is, uh, and it's kind of like being an actor, you do all this research and then you let it sit there and have, I write stream of conscious, I kind of let myself go. So I let it all be there, but I have to kind of know what it is. And and then I'm lucky enough, my sister Kathy has a, a beautiful farm in Fayetteville, which I visited many times. Um, so I had all those photos and memories and so forth. And that's why I set it there because I wanted it on a farm and I thought, well, I'll set it there. And I looked up 1918 Fayetteville, what's going on there in Arkansas. Um, Cause I hadn't spent time on a farm in Missouri. So, um, I could use that farm because I specifically wanted a farm where there could be a young man and a horse and there could be a blizzard. And um, I've been in Fayetteville where there's a terrible ice storm. Like the trees are so heavy with ice, they almost fall. Um, and I used uh, those memories. And also growing up in St. Louis, we would have some terrible blizzards too. So I love extreme weather in my writing. I love a heat wave or a blizzard. So. Come I'm, back to St. Louis. We have heat waves all the time. I, I know. Maybe that's why I love bl uh, heat waves and blizzards because I grew right. with them. Um, but those are tactile memories. Uh, there's a scene in um, The Root of Everything, uh, that hill, Art Hill, mm -hmm. um, where my gay uh, character, oh, actually, they go naked it's winter and they go naked swimming in that uh what is it a reservoir or a pond? I, I literally have a note when i took notes as i was reading that i literally have a note that says st louis 1966 swimming naked and in, in, uh at the art museum art hill yeah yes yeah they um they, it's kind of a dare and they're both very yep. athletic so it's like they're able to not get hypothermia and do that but right that i shaped that into a scene but what i had done um, years ago with my siblings was we were out in a five below blizzard and we're um, sledding down that hill and I actually crashed my head. I still have a scar right here because um, I swirled down the hill. <laughs> it crashed into something. I remember my brother David was had gone before me and chipped his tooth out. His tooth flew out and he was waving to me. No, don't go. And I'm like, yeah, here I come. And so anyway, the right. long I think that it. happens a lot. Yeah. Well, so, um, yeah. Before we kind of get to the end here and, and do some Q&A, I think I may have time to read this. So this is the passage from Root of Everything that I wanted to read real quickly. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with uh, Josie and her son. It comes towards right. the end of the story. So, um, and this is coming from the son's perspective. He never imagined his mother being angry at him. He gave so much energy to his being angry at her. He never thought much of his impact on her. He watched her watching his son, and he thought of gran Granny Emma watching him, speaking to him, and he knew there were terrible regrets, misty things hovering just above the surface of his life, things he knew, thought of sometimes just as he was falling asleep, dreamed of and forgot, and he knew, too, it was what she had told him long ago that really haunted him. And Bo, Granny Emma had said it was just the root of things, the flaws of being human, wasn't that it? It all goes by so quickly, Josie said, we do our best. So just real quickly, I think I literally sent you an email when I read that. I wasn't expecting it mm -hmm. because, again, the focus is primarily on the male characters. And what I took away from it, um, especially being a parent now, is in, in media presentations, we almost always see it's, it's sort of a cliche or a trope of the 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 child either grown or as a child sort of lashing out at the parents, you ruined my life, you sucked, you did everything wrong. And, and not always, but typically what you see from the parent is either this, this outward guilt or this inward sort of um, guilt or just feeling really bad about things. And what I, what I loved about that uh, piece and that passage is that, as you said, this woman during the time in which she existed didn't have the liberties and freedoms that, that modern women have, and yet she lived her own life, whether that was, um, and maybe there were some regrets there, but I just love that that was in there because um, 
it just really resonated with me that you had a parent and especially a female at that time saying, look, you know, my life, basically my life wasn't a, a, um, a bowl of cherries either. So let's kind of be real about this. I just, I appreciated that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I really wanted that character of Josie to be real and human and flawed and also non-apologetic. Um, she right. meets her husband, she goes to live in Paris. She, she makes mistakes. Um, and then at the end with her son there, um, uh, and they're watching, he, there are people out there, he, he gets married and, um, they have a little kid and everything. And, and she kind of shrugs also, I think she's wearing like a Chanel skirt or something on the, <laughs> on the lawn. And he earlier in that scene looks at her like, Lord, she dresses up even to like sit on the lawn. She's very uncomfortable. Like, what am I right. doing? But she's very much uh, no regrets, you know, kind of like I, I certainly did my best. And, yeah. um, you know, what are you going to do? So. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I wasn't expecting it and I and I appreciated it. Um, so before we do Q&A, which I think we're right there, um, we were going to do a fun little exercise, well, not exercise, a little trivia quiz here oh, uh, for folks that might be interested uh, in getting a, a free T-shirt. Um, we have a question for you and you can type it in the comments or the chat. And the first one that gets it right will get a free T-shirt. So the question is, um, how many books has Scott written? And of course, this includes um, the current novella with these two stories in it. So if you're interested and would like a t-shirt, you can go ahead and type that in. Yes, the right answer gets a t-shirt. And a big hint, I kind of gave the answer in I my was introduction. Say, I, yeah. yeah, you did, really, quite, <laughs> quite frankly. All right, we don't have, well, I guess, I, for, I wish forget there's a little bit of a time uh, delay between the, so... Still have an opportunity stuff, to win because uh, we have people. The fan book stays here. We're not including that in the <laughs> yeah. package, just so you know. Yes, you have to guess. And uh, I'll be uh, I'll be on the radio in St. Louis. If you're St. Louis people out there on July 28th at noon. Um, and then for New York people, or for St. Louis people, for Shane and Don, you can just fly to St. to New York uh, August 12th. We're having a big, splashy launch party um with uh all sorts of uh, writers uh, uh writers we have a uh, uh, jacqueline hyde as a drag queen hosting it maybe an opera singer and um a clown so it's a wide mix <laughs> i do i like to do more of a variety show when i do events like that like live events and read and eat and sell things and sell books, but also bring in um, some of the creative community in um, in New York City. Great. Uh, we are getting, there's some good guesses, but no one has gotten the answer yet. So. Oh, gosh. Um, and I want to remind everyone that, because we do have a couple of questions in the uh, comments as well. So if you have already ordered a copy from Left Pink Books and want to have it personalized, yeah, just give us a call tomorrow. Um, I, all the books are on by my desk. So if they're having trouble finding the books, just be like, uh, Shane said, all I needed to do was call and just update my order and I'll take care of it from there. Uh, <clears throat> so we have uh, some, oh, and a reminder to everyone who may have missed my introduction because we have had several people join since then. Um, you can order a signed and personalized copy. Scott will be coming in in uh, what on the 26th mm -hmm. uh, to sign and personalize, and then we will be getting books out in the mail. Uh, books will be available for pickup. If you want to, you can request a small, medium, or large T-shirt. And uh, a special note that if you are having your books mailed to you, uh, to request priority mail or UPS for the mailing uh, method if you would like to have a shirt. Um, and do we have the correct answer yet? Not yet. Uh, so still have that. And let's get to, we have a couple of comments. Um, Evan says, hi, Scott. I made it, so excited. Uh, Lewis clan fan says i love the title and look forward to the relationship the characters to nature and 
I think this might be a question. Uh, so Amy is asking, what is lightning about? I can't wait, to, can't wait to read Root of Everything. Uh, so maybe just uh, a quick recap of uh, your sure. Lightning. Uh, yeah, Lightning uh, is 1918. It's set on a farm in Arkansas, and it's a young man. His name is Bud, which I named after my uncle Bud. And um, uh, he, they get his father wins a um, a horse in a, a poker game, and then um, not to give it away, it happens fairly early. His father dies in the blizzard, goes out and gets stuck, and talk about bad weather and gets stuck in this, dies in a blizzard. So he kind of becomes the man of the family, but he also starts to ride the horse for emotional release and um, becomes a really good with horses uh, and so forth. And um, ultimately he starts to have some um, emotional feelings about another young man he knows and his rich aunt um, realizes, she's in New York and she realizes he, um, is really good with horses and may want to bring him to New York because she raises horses. So he faces a, a, a big decision. So that's your wrap up <laughs> of lightning and lots of description and setting too uh, in that one. Well, we did finally get a winner. Uh, yeah. The correct guess is six. So right. Kathleen may be related to you, uh, Kathleen Hess. Oh, uh, good. yes, Kathleen. <laughs> So I you better get it right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Karen is asking, what about those great NY frames, New York frames? Oh, it, my glasses? I think that maybe that's what it's referencing to. <laughs> I wasn't quite certain, but I was also <laughs> guessing your glasses. <laughs> These are Tom Ford. They're Tom Ford glasses. Um, when COVID hit and everything went um, virtual like this, uh, I treated myself to these gigantic glasses um, because I had to pop on the screen. I do a lot of teaching and working and writing and readings and all sorts of stuff. So I, I um, got these big old Tom Ford glasses. So thanks, Karen, whoever Karen is, thank you. <laughs> and um, run out to Tom Ford store and buy yourself a pair. Uh, so I have a question for you, Scott. Yes. Um, I'm a big fan of short novels, novellas. I love short stories. I wish I read more short stories, honestly. But I'm wondering for you personally, what your, like, when you make that decision of how, what length something is going to be. So do you know, kind of going in, like, this has enough meat to be a novella? Or do you think, like, maybe this is just going to be a short story. Like, when do you decide that? Um, yeah, people ask that a lot and students and other writers. Uh, uh, I'm an organic writer. I'm an instinctual writer. So I do know when it's a short story. Uh, I think the form of the short story is wonderful. Um, it's, I'm not, uh, that's not my forte. I've done a few short stories, but I, I know when I de an idea is a short story. But most of my work is bigger, uh, and but I don't know the the whether it's going to broaden out to novel or stay in novella uh, until I'm in the middle of it. Um, and agents, publishers, people really prefer novels. Um, so. The, and it actually, I mean, someone like, I love Ian McEwen. If you've read um, Comfort of Strangers, uh, they call it a novel because he's famous, but it's a novella. Um, so it's easier to sell novels. But um, it's some things just like the root of everything. You would think that would be a novel because it's three generations and all this. And it just shaped itself in a way that I just kind of knew this is, the rhythm of it, and this is where it closes. Um, and I also tried for the first time, if you've read my other books, this one is nonlinear. It's almost, it's put together almost like a puzzle. And it goes from like 1920 to 1980 in these three different people. And I was just really, again, organically drawn to tell the story that way. 
um, and and then it it shaped. And I did have I have trusted readers before I published, and I said, you know, this is kind of short, and let me know what you think. And um, they were fine with it. They said, yeah, it, it it's it has a lot, but the the length and shape you chose is it works so. Uh, yeah, I always wonder, like, how these, like, 800, 900, like, 1,200-page novels, like, happen. I'm like, what I, type of mind is, like, oh, yeah, I've got this great idea. It's going to be 1,200 pages. <laughs> like, right, right. There's nothing like a good series. Yeah. I'm looking at you, George R. R. Martin, if you're out there. Like, <laughs> right. And I and I think if you're as uh, you know prolific as a Stephen King, you get by with whether it's twelve hundred pages or fifteen thousand. They know it sells, so that the editor or whoever's looking at that is like, yeah, if it were anybody else, we'd probably chop this, but we're just going to kind of overlook it. That's sort of my take on some of that. Right. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> uh, it Sometimes is. Sometimes it needs chopping. Clearly evident that like a hundred of these pages could have easily Unlikely gone to the wayside. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I mean, sometimes, like, because I, I do read some of the popular uh, authors as well. So, like, they clearly know what they're doing anyway, even if there's some extra stuff. So I won't, like, bad talk any, uh, oh, <laughs> definitely won't bad talk Stephen King. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> I love Stephen King. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's impressive, I mean, to write that, like, Game of Thrones or that, multi-series with so many plot lines and so many characters and uh, my work always tends to be i mean like a 300 page novel is is about as long as i go um, my stories tend to be that length and shape or shorter i don't see worlds in that i guess i see more moments in time or periods of time uh, but i'm impressed with people that uh, a lot of those that get turned into you know, cable shows and so forth um, that go on and on and on and on and have multiple stories and multiple plots and um, and it's good for the writer because then you know a, an agent loves a good three three book deal. You know, like a have three books ready, um, which can be very good. Um, yeah. Uh, so Kathleen is asking uh, on, along, along the same lines. So an author needs to publish novels in order to get novellas or short stories published. And sadly, especially in book form, um, because there are a lot of outlets for short stories and novellas that aren't necessarily book form. Because um, you have a lot of magazines that publish short stories. I mean, I don't have to like the New Yorker and whatnot. Um, but you can actually be like a lot of authors publish incredible short stories in collections that then are in uh, magazines that then go on to be in collections like the best American short stories that grant uh, those sorts of magazine book compilations that really are fantastic for short story readers. Right. Yeah, and a good a good short story collection is a great way to start too for the writers out there watching. Um, a lot of people will start with a great collection of short stories and then um, move to a novel, novella. Um, this book actually, uh, there was a press. Um, ah, there it is. There was a press in uh, Virginia that really liked the root of everything and wanted to pair it. She was like, well, let's do four or five of your short stories with it. And I'm like, I don't have five short stories. Um, so I ended up, uh, this, strangely enough, um, Lightning was a longer novel length uh, piece I'd written, but not published. And I decided to reshape it because I had someone interested. They said, well, if you could give me two novellas, we could do a volume, but I'm not gonna just do one. You've got to either give me a second novella or short stories. Um, so I shaped that from, it was called The Jockey. And um, I shaped that from a novel into um, the novella. And, you know, actually relied ha more heavily on his um, LGBTQ romance and that 
coming of age portion. Um, so that's how. Yeah, that and the and the one uh, passage in Lightning, and you alluded to it earlier between him him and uh, Jerky. Um, I, I mean, I I think most you you kind of see it coming in in a good way, but I. Um, it, it was it was very well done like it was very um erotic without being um <laughs> sort of like bodice ripping over the top uh it was just as, as brief as it was in the in the story um it was it was um it was very it was very sensual i thought it was very uh very well done right thank you yeah uh, so Valerie is asking, how does being magazine published differ from book published and how do the journeys differ? And Scott, since you do edit as well, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, like also including like the online experience. Right. Well, it's a great place to start. I mean, online magazines, short stories, everything's uh, virtual and online now. Um, I just had something in St. Louis. Well, gosh the St. Louis Magazine and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And I didn't even know if it would be in print. So I told my brother, go pick up a paper. Am I in there too or just online? So getting a short story, um, getting work online is, is great, is a wonderful way to begin um, and, and get things out there. Our, you know, I mean, just do a lot of online shorts, if, especially if you love short stories. Um, or there are also like um, a lot of the literary journals are also now online and they will, um, some of them do take longer stories like 50, 70 pages, um, maybe even a novella. Um, so it's definitely um, a great route. I mean, and then, you know, with your novels, you've got uh, eBooks, audiobooks, you've got all that, but, I think still with novels, uh, a print copy, a hard copy um, is still important. I mean, I know that's how I like to read. Um, so when you get to that length, um, there's something about reading a shorter story online sometimes makes more sense, but a novel, um, I, at least for me, I still like the print, you know, pick it up, set it down, all that sort of thing. Same. Same. <laughs> Um, this has been a great conversation. We have a lot more time for audience Q&A, so we can really talk about anything. We can talk about character development. Um, I kind of want to get back to talking about like the juicy, the uh, the sex scenes, but uh, that's mainly because I'm reading. Uh, we have a, a bookstore romance day coming up, and I'm reading a I'm going to be the moderator for a queer uh, romance panel, which I'm really excited about. So I'm like adverse into a lot of queer romance. <laughs> I am loving it to say the least. That's, it's a great category too, uh, queer romance. And um, I'm in the outright, um, my events page too, for people out there, scoutalexanderhess.com, the events page has all my upcoming events and outright books in um, DC in Washington um, is an LGBTQ conference. And uh, sometimes the ro the gay romance panels are the most popular. Um, and I know some really fun um, uh, writers, some friends, some online friends who uh, write that category and sometimes YA um, gay romance. Um, and, and it's great. It's fun. It's, it can be, I always tell my students too, like everything counts. Um, and I mean, I write, um, I always have sensuality and lovemaking and, and, and I mean, it's part of life, right? So it's, it's part of my character's journeys, but my journey has been more, I love literary writing, description, um, poetic writing, historical fiction. Um, and that's who I am. Uh, but when my students are like, oh, well, should I try to do that? But I, I'm like, well, no, if you like genre, if you like gay romance, if you like, I mean, that is more marketable um, and, and more saleable. So go for what, where your passion is um, because 
well, that's what you should do anyway, but also it's a great market. Like YA, gay romance, those are wonderful, um, fun, popular markets, especially right now. So, for, for you personally, Scott, do you have a line? Like, do you know when you're writing a sex scene that like, okay, like this is love and this is part of life, but I'm not going to cross over into like, do you know where that line is for you? Um, yeah, I mean, um, in my fiction, in, in my love of language and poetic language, I'm not interested in, in body parts. I'm, I'm interested in emotional connection and, but also in truth. So in The Butcher's Sons, there's a character, Dickie, who's really rough and tumble and mean and crazy and has this wild relationship um, with a woman in the 30s. And their sex scenes are more graphic because that's who they are. Um, he ends up getting involved with um, organized crime and this and that. So their scenes are a bit more in the point of view of who they are. So when he's, um, I don't even know what we can say on online, but the F word, you know, he'll he'll <laughs> like get gritty with this. She's like a jazz singer, I think, with this woman because that's who he is. So I'm more about like the truth of it, but not about, it just has to be truthful to the scene and the character I'm not really interested in, I guess, titillation or creating something that doesn't make sense to the truth of what the characters are doing. Um, but I've written some pretty, also the river runs red. I, I have a man who's a coke addict. Um, it's set in 1890, but he does some very devious things. Um, he's the villain. Um, so there are some somewhat graphic scenes um, and I say somewhat, but then I'll go to another town, <laughs> like, and I'll say, oh, it's just a little bit. And they're like, oh my God, it's obscene. And I'm like, oh my goodness, do you think so? Um, but yeah, so I will go there when, particularly that man um, in that book, uh, I would cr cringe sometimes at what he would do, but that was who he was as this in intense villain, so. You know, I think the story tells you what to do. Yeah. And, and like your instinct as an author, like, I think that the characters let you know, like, okay, this is, this is what we're doing. This is where we're going. But yeah. Uh, Valerie is asking, why do you pick the time periods you've used and what do you use for historical research? Um, I, I choose the time periods there's usually something about them that intrigue me. Um, the Butcher's Sons, I wanted a story about three brothers and I wanted them in close quarters. So I picked a butcher shop and I, I did do my research. I go online. Um, I live in New York. So I went to Hell's Kitchen where the old butcher shops, I went down to the meat market. I interviewed butchers. Um, one guy who likes his family had had a butcher shop for a, hundred years so he could fill me in and what I found was like not 1930 because of how the meat I did all this research on how they got meat from New Jersey up to Hell's Kitchen in 1930 and I it and the lack of refrigeration the there were like so many conflicts and and then I thought ooh and let's make it a heat wave so that is how I end up deciding as I shape the story, like I love conflict. Um, I love problems and flaws. And so in that, that book, I said, oh good, let's, let's make it 1930. It's really hard to run a butcher shop in a heat wave. And then I made one of the characters gay because I was like, oh, and what would it be like to come out as a young gay man in Hell's Kitchen, which was pretty rough back then. Um, in 1930. So, yeah. And research has become so much easier because of everything you can learn online. Um, I'm writing a, my newest book is set in Delhi, India, because my husband and I went there twice, um, which is actually harder to research 
it's such a fascinating place. And I made a lot of notes. I took a lot of pictures, but to immerse myself in that and then write about it is that's been harder because it's so unique. And the research on particular streets in Delhi, India is not as robust as, you know, Hell's Kitchen. So I guess I'll have to go back. Well, I want to thank you both. Uh, I guess if we don't have any more questions, maybe one will trickle in as I remind everyone that they can order a signed and personalized copy from Left Bank Books. I have just reshared the link that people can get the uh, a copy from Left Bank Books. We have a lot in stock and ready to go out. So uh, Scott will be in on July 26th and we'll be personalizing or just signing if you like just want a signed copy, like it'll still look great on your bookshelf. And don't forget to request a uh, t-shirt as well. So small, medium, or large t-shirts that can be mailed or ready for pickup uh, either way. And uh, I will be letting Scott know soon uh, so that he has them with him when he uh, travels to St. Louis. Absolutely. Uh, Don, did you have a last question that is uh that you're dying to ask it, you know I, I, as we were just discussing this about the different types of writing and things like that i was i i think lightning would maybe make a great um origin for maybe a movie or a netflix or so it just uh i enjoyed both stories but that one to me for some reason just stuck with me more um um, I don't know, it just it stayed with me longer for some reason. And maybe it's because it was originally a novel. Um, so I, I like, I wanted more. I felt like I wanted more, not in a negative way, but I felt like, wow, if this were full length, I would stick with this character to see what happens if he goes out into the world beyond his little circle. So um, I don't know. I just, I could see that being something in a different medium, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am always open um, a few filmmakers reached out to me at different points. Um, nothing came of it, but um, the man that made Grey Gardens with Drew Barrymore, uh, mm -hmm. like a remake or something, um, it was, had been interested in the Butcher Sons at one point. Um, and I get little bits and pieces. Um, so maybe someday. I'd love to turn on, I love HBO, so I want to turn on <laughs> HBO and see Lightning. HBO right. Lightning starring, I don't know, some bright 15-year-old actor. Right. <laughs> uh, Mickey's asking, what radio station on July 28th? Is that the day that you're doing St. Louis on the yeah, Air? Yeah, July 28th at noon on St. Louis Public Radio. Mm -hmm. um, 90.7? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. in. It's yeah. just uh, pre preset number four <laughs> on my card. <laughs> Yes, same thing. that's going to be fun. So, um, and that's all on my website, scottalexanderhess.com, um, the events page. It's got all the events, all the readings, including the radio. Um, so that'll be fun. And I'll be in St. Louis. Go to the radio and come say hello to me. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for watching tonight. Be sure to check out our event calendar on left-bank.com. Uh, you can uh, click on the link to order the book. And then when you're done doing that, go to the event calendar and check out some of the incredible events, including the one that I'm really excited about, the uh, uh, Bookstore Romance Day. So you can see me asking a whole bunch of questions about uh, to all sorts of uh, queer-influenced authors. And I think most of them are. I think they're all queer. I'm not 100% certain, but uh, I'll just say they are. <laughs> they're writing fantastic queer romance as well. Um, but yeah, thank you for being here, Scott and Don. Thank you for this incredible conversation. And we hope to see everyone again really soon. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Shane. Thank you so much.